Welcome everyone. Good afternoon from Chicago. Uh, for those of you in Africa, if you're in South Africa, that's good evening. Good evening to you. Good evening, Africa. Uh, those in New Zealand, it's, uh, it's morning, right, Paul? In your home country, I think. I think everybody's in bed still. Uh, okay, those of you in New Zealand, uh, we send you greetings for as, as you sleep. So we're just waiting for everyone to to sign in before we begin this very important lecture. So welcome everyone. And we are about to begin because we like to start according to uh, the schedule. My name is Stan Chu Ilo. I am a research professor of uh, world Christianity at the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology here at DePaul University, Chicago, USA. The Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology is one of the premier research centers, not only in the United States, but also in the world. The focus of the center is to track the movement of Catholicism and Christianity in general as it crosses different spiritual and cultural frontiers beyond the West. So our focus of research here is on Christianity in the global South, where many scholars say the center of gravity of Christianity is shifting. So our center organizes uh, periodic lectures like this, where we bring in uh, some of the great minds in specific areas of research to speak to us, as well as to share the fruits of their research. And since we are going through a pandemic for quite some time now, all of us suffering different ways from this pandemic, we've not been able to have a research uh, scholar uh, visit us since uh, 2020. So Professor Paul Gifford, who is our lecturer for today, uh, is the first in this, in this COVID, COVID time to visit the center as a visiting senior research professor. Professor Paul Gifford is from New Zealand, as you will hear from his accent. He taught at the University of London for nearly 25 years, specializing in religion in Africa, mainly Christianity, but also Islam in West Africa. His primary focus has been Pentecostalism, but he has also done research for the All Africa Conference of Churches, the umbrella body of the mainline Protestant churches in Africa. Despite his base in London, he has been able to average about six months in each of those years in Africa. So he's now an emeritus and lives in Ethiopia. We welcome Professor Gifford to Chicago, someone I am happy to say is a friend, someone who inspires me a lot and whose contribution to African theology African Christian studies in general are quite uh, cutting edge and um, have broken new grounds. So please join me in welcoming Professor Gifford to give the lecture titled An Africa or a Public uh, Theology. Welcome, Professor Paul Gifford. Thank you, Stan. Let me begin by thanking DePaul and especially the center 
for giving me this time here. It's been a wonderful opportunity. And let me thank you particularly, Stan, for all you've done to make it so. Thank you for your kindness and your real inspiration. And thank you, Karen, too. I hope you realize just how grateful I am. I take my title from an article by Tanico Malaleki of the University of Pretoria, a theologian many of you will know. His article is entitled, Why I Am Not a Public Theologian, and appears in the World Council of Churches publication, The Ecumenical Review of 2021. Melaleke is an exhilarating theologian to read. His journal articles and his regular columns in South African Sunday papers are often written in anger, in rage, even fury. He makes no claim to be objective. He takes no prisoners. He names names. He fingers culprits. In this case, the University of Stellenbosch, its graduate students, and the authors of the 30 chapters in a 2020 book entitled African Public Theology, nearly half of them Nigerians. Melaleke's complaint is the global imperial designs of this theology, which in his opinion is trying, in his words, to annex, possess, homogenize, and globalize African and black theology Although these theologians won't come clean and admit their imperial ambitions and their homogenizing designs. This public theology, with its global pretensions, its fondness for the elimination of difference, its predilection to slot others into its own ready-made frames, means it's, in his words, too nice and too neat for the dirty, smelly, messy, chaotic contexts of Africa. Today, I want to start from Melaleke's insistence on taking the context seriously, and I'll return to him later. I want to raise three things which I consider characteristic of African Catholicism, its huge involvement in development, its lack of interest in ecumenism, and its vulnerability to the drift towards Pentecostalism. First, involvement in development. This is distinguished by institutions, the most prominent of which is the school. Historically, churches were far more involved in education than colonial governments. This contribution is widely celebrated. Thus, Nelson Mandela addressing the Eighth General Assembly of the World Council in 1998 in Harare, my generation is the product of missionary education. Without that, I would not be here today. I will never have sufficient words to thank the missionaries for what they did for us. Although of all denominations, the Catholic Church is by now, the, the, is now the far most heavily committed. This was not always so, but since the 1920s, Catholics have built large educational structures. In Nigeria, by the 1960s, it was claimed that the bishops had more than 30,000 Catholic teachers on their payroll. As independence came to African countries, the status of these schools changed considerably. In most countries, the newly independent state took greater control of schools. In Africa, according to the 2021 Global Catholic Education Report, there were 18,871 preschools, 44,745 primary schools, nearly 16,000 secondary schools, with 178,000 students in Catholic institutes, of higher education. These figures admittedly need some explanation because there's no one definition of what constitutes a Catholic school. It's worth emphasizing that bare statistics do not convey the quality. Kenya is one of the countries that publishes annual league tables to show the academic ratings of schools. 
and Catholic schools have traditionally been very conspicuous near the top. In Senegal, perhaps 95% Muslim, the Catholic Church is enormously respected, mainly because of its schools, among the very best in the country. In Zambia, the number of students at university who have done part or all of their schooling in Catholic institutions is well over the proportion one would expect. The average pass rate at Catholic schools in Zambia is similarly well above the norm. Reasons given for the acad academic superiority include the discipline and organization, teacher and student morale, better qualified staff, more adequate equipment, greater commitment of staff, and the fact that most have been single sex schools. Healthcare provides a similar picture. In Africa in 2012, according to the latest CARA report I could find, the Catholic Church operated 1,298 hospitals, 5,256 outpatient clinics, 229 leprosaria, 632 homes for the elderly and disabled, and nearly 1,400 orphanages and 2,000 nurseries. In all, over 16,000 health centers. Again, government regulation varies from country to country, but no other single agency on the continent can rival this contribution. Again, this contribution is generally celebrated. In Zambia in 2012, the Minister of Health gratefully acknowledged that 60% of all the health services available in rural areas were provided by the Catholic Church. Anecdotal evidence suggests that half of all AIDS-related services in Africa are provided by Catholic organizations. The proportion is even higher in rural areas. Development is not new to Catholicism. Catholicism never restricted itself to evangelization, preaching, and sacraments, but it has now extended its service provision to cover almost everything imaginable, including rehabilitation of the justice system, strengthening food production, microfinance, nutrition outreach, programs, programs of water sanitation, HIV and AIDS education, conflict resolution, agricultural productivity. If, as is sometimes still claimed, Catholicism used to be focused on the afterlife, this is no longer the case. All this involvement, of course, has been justified as an integral and logical part of the Christian calling. Genuinely Christian activity, motivated by Christianity, mandated by Christian theology. However, as the church functions now, especially dependent on overseas funds, which are increasingly for relief and development, Catholicism is in danger of becoming identified with those works. From its development work comes its high visibility, its appeal, its status. The funding required for this involvement tends to determine its priorities and internal organization, the way it is seen and the expectations made of it. So the emphasis on development does not come without some tension. Emphasized by Pope Benedict particularly, his first encyclical made the point clearly, the church's charitable activity must not become just another form of social assistance. He was insisting that the Catholic Church is not a development agency. We are the people of God on earth, the mystical body of Christ. This same concern motivated his dismissal in 2011 of the Zimbabwean Leslie Ann Knight as the head of Caritas International the umbrella body of 165 Catholic relief, development and service agencies because the organization allegedly was not explicitly or not sufficiently Catholic. The Pope was making a very valid point 
development is not Christianity, even if one believes that it is that necessarily entailed in Christianity. Despite Benedict's insistence, the tension remains. It's not perfectly clear how one might distinguish a Catholic exercise of election monitoring from a non-Catholic monitoring exercise, especially if, as in Nigeria, it includes Muslims. Likewise, how does Catholic slum clearance differ from any other form or water purification? It's worth drawing attention to the seemingly cheerful acquiescence in this NGOization of Catholicism that characterizes an increasing number of books on Catholicism. John Allen's The Future Church purports to offer, as the title suggests, a picture of what global Catholicism is becoming. He presents Catholicism not as a tradition and an institution conceptualizing and relating to and experiencing divine reality, but as a pressure group or lobby with a vision for improving this world. His book outlines possible Catholic contributions to living in harmony with Muslims, coping with aging populations, living more equitably. There are chapters on biotechnology, globalization and ecology with detailed expositions on water wars, protecting the Amazon, preserving the traditions and cultures of indigenous peoples, pro dalit activity in India. In short, Catholicism is concerned with almost everything that Oxfam and USAID are, that's the United States Agency for International Development. There's virtually nothing in this book about how in the 21st century Catholics might conceptualize the divine and how they might relate to it. Revealingly, it's in a comparison with Pentecostalism that Allen casually notes that different streams in Catholicism will have different attitudes to the supernatural. That's one of the few hints in the book that Catholicism is anything more than a more cohesive United Nations. Robert Calderizzi's book, Earthly Mission, The Catholic Church and World Development, is, as the title makes plain, expressly concerned with the church's development efforts. Yet nowhere does he even hint that the Catholic Church might be anything more than a development agency. He cites several people, many of them priests and nuns, who discount specific religious motivation. A priest in Bangladesh whom Calderizi obviously admires becomes impatient when asked if he regarded himself as a Catholic or humanitarian. I don't use these categories. I'm just a person who is here and can help. A Breton woman in the Philippines asked the same question, replies both, I suppose, although I think I would do this even if I had no faith. Calderizi hopes the church can keep issues of identity under control and sharpen its social message. For the opportunities to transform lives are numerous, in his words, if only the church can overcome its current preoccupations with identity. Of course, Catholics involved in development today explain their involvement as a theological imperative and articulate their personal Catholic motivation. However, so much of the involvement itself is little different from that performed by other NGOs. For such activity, Christian motivation is not necessary. More importantly, for the future of the institution, it seems to be becoming difficult to transfer that religious motivation to a new generation. Calderizi captures some of the dynamics in his description of Lakor Hospital in northern Uganda, one of the largest referral hospitals in East Africa, founded by a husband and wife team as a Catholic hospital, funded heavily by Catholic bodies, and with a board of governors still headed by the local bishop. 
Its greatest success is that two imaginative and dedicated individuals devoted their lives to creating it for their own humanitarian reasons, inspired by their faith, but eager to pass it on intact to a new generation that would not be interested in religious labels. So much for the huge involvement in development as a key element in the Catholic Church in Africa. My second element of contemporary African Catholicism is its limited interest in ecumenism. I would link this with the involvement in development. I would argue that this is explicable from the fact that it has been more important to relate to bodies overseas, especially funding bodies, and to other churches in the locality with the aim of collaboration. I have attended both synods of bishops for Africa as an observer, and these synods clearly reveal just how low ecumenism was on the list of African priorities. The synod format gives every delegate 10 minutes to make his individual contribution. And these clearly reveal the issues of preoccupying the participants. One would speak on married deacons, another on the role of women, another lay involvement, then someone on new churches, invariably called sects. It has to be said that ecumenism hardly featured. Of course, in nearly all African countries, Christian health institutions combine and say the Christian Health Association of Liberia to negotiate with government, for example, about importing tax-free drugs. And Christian education bodies combine to present a common front to governments for purposes of influencing legislation and so on. But beyond that, cooperation is slight. The Catholic Church, as indeed the other churches, simply have other priorities, in the Catholic case, overwhelmingly development. Let me digress on what I personally think is an interesting theological case, and I hope it will be interesting to the Paul Center too, with your interest in borders of baptism, and again, beyond the borders of baptism, where membership of the church is stressed to trump all other allegiances and identities. This case also has a Vincentian interest. In their reorganizing after the Vatican Council, a missionary congregation that I won't name here, they can speak for themselves, decided to open a mission in Ethiopia. As they familiarized themselves with the area entrusted to them, they dis discovered that almost all the peoples in its allotted area were already Christian of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church. The Gies word Tewahedo means united or made one. The six churches in this Oriental Orthodox family have traditionally been labeled in the West monophysite. That's a label they vigorously reject. They say that the Catholic position of one person with two natures is it introduces a schizoid element of one person in Christ, a schizoid element. All they are insisting on is the unity. Well, these missionaries among the Orthodox were challenged to clarify their role. Were they there to plant a Catholic church by converting members of the Orthodox church? Was their mission to establish a Catholic church from the relatively few traditionalists in the area? Or were they there to help build up the Christian community already there, that is, the Orthodox believers? The decree on ecumenism of Vatican II states in section 17 that the Orthodox churches possess the full Catholic and apostolic character of the church. So these missionaries decided to assist the local Orthodox church already there. In this decision, they had the full support of the apostolic delegate of the time. They enjoyed much wider support. The clergy of the Catholic vicariat, mainly Vincentians, both local and expatriate, accepted the validity of their mission. They also received full support from what was then the Pontifical Secretariat for promoting Christian unity. However, the policy drew considerable opposition to 
As I remarked, the apostolic delegate at the time of the mission began was fully in support, but subsequent delegates were opposed. And soon an Ethiopian Catholic bishop complained to the, Catholic, to the congregation of the evangelization of peoples that the missionaries were refusing to establish the Catholic church. Greatest opposition came from the local bishop. He eventually came to forbid the missionaries from cooperating further with the Orthodox Church. They complied, subsequently having only informal links with the Orthodox Church. Of course, there's far more involved here than the theological issue of ecclesiology. There's the whole question of the identity of the Catholic Ethiopian Catholic Church in relation to the Orthodox. The present Catholic Church began in Ethiopia with the arrival of the Vincentians in 1837. Most of its early members had previously belonged to the Orthodox Church. Many of its first priests had formerly been Orthodox priests. Some of them were subjected to tremendous pressure to return to the Orthodox communion. One of these, the Vincentian Gebre Mikhail, has been beatified, martyred for the Catholic faith by the Emperor Tewodros in 1855, and his huge mural adorns the chapel in the elaborate Catholic Secretariat building in Addis Ababa. Did the missionary's ecclesiology mean that all this heroism was really unnecessary? The story of this mission, though, focuses the crucial question, where are the boundaries? What's the Catholic Church's understanding of other churches? And what practical policy follows from that understanding? It seems in this case that there was no agreement on the issue, even within the church itself. The case in Ethiopia found the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity and the Congregation for Eastern Churches accepting the understanding of the missionaries. But the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples taking the view of the local bishop. The divergence was palpable. My third instance of issues characterizing African Catholicism bears on what is sometimes called the Pentecostal explosion in Africa the phenomenon of entirely new churches mushrooming everywhere. In Kenya, where it is required that churches be registered before operating, the Attorney General in 2007 announced that the country had 8,520 registered churches, had 6,740 applications pending, and that 60 new applications were filed every month. The procedure for vetting new bodies was overwhelmed and systems had totally broken down. And other African countries have seen similar proliferation. These churches are hardly uniform. They differ enormously. But for limitations of time, without too much distortion, I will label them all as Pentecostal with, as I have long argued, their two most salient features, the prosperity gospel and the emphasis on spiritual causality. Overwhelming the adher overwhelmingly, the inherent adherents of these churches are not converts from traditional practice. They come from other churches and a huge number are Catholics. Many, of course, were, were purely nominal Catholics in the first place. Many, however, were not. Sometimes this phenomenon is misunderstood. I recently read a prominent African theologian implying that this shift is the result of underhand pressure and promises. But I don't think this stands up. Nobody is forcing them to move. They join for various reasons, but the appeal of these newer churches is in my opinion related to the two features I mentioned, the prosperity gospel, and their emphasis on spirit agency. The prosperity gospel in Africa has long intrigued observers. How can an assurance of wealth, prosperity, abundance, 
have much traction where it can be achieved only with much difficulty and relatively rarely. Kate Bowler's recent study of the prosperity gospel in America is helpful here, not least for the important distinction between hard prosperity and soft prosperity. Hard prosperity promises wealth, often linked to the seed faith idea of giving money in order to receive more. Soft prosperity has less focus on material prosperity and more on achievement, success, victory. <clears throat> I would argue that the big Willow Creek Association of Churches founded from and headquartered here in Chicago is of this soft prosperity type. The head pastor of the flagship church in South Barrington preached last month on the story of Gideon from the book of Judges. With 300 men, Gideon routed the vast army of the Midianites, showing that with a positive attitude and faith in God and yourself, there's nothing you can't do. No success beyond your grasp. No odds can stop you. Willow Creek is not crass about money, but its Christianity is about triumph, victory, achievement, fulfillment. Bowler well shows that the rise of prosperity gospel here owes a lot to the American context. Such thinking resonated profoundly with the American social imaginary. It affirmed the American myth of triumph through honesty, hard work, self-reliance, and perseverance over adversity. And of course, it also affirmed the basic economic structures on which economic enterprise stood. The rise of prosperity gospel in North America owes a lot to that post-war economic boom. All revivalists, she writes, were preaching upward mobility to people already on the way up. These were the boom years in which many families considered the possibility of home ownership for the first time or were able to enjoy hitherto unobtainable luxuries, such as indoor plumbing, a private telephone, and electrical appliances such as stoves and refrigerators. Pentecostal enjoyed the post-war economic boom as contented middle-class citizens and proved as keen as any American to believe God might have had something to do with this. Modern capitalism engendered new admiration as a seemingly perfect system of decent wages, high employment rates, and cheaply manufactured goods. The mass marketing and assembly lines churning out cars, ovens, washing machines, lawn mowers, and sectional sofas brought the logic of modernity to believers' homes and driveways. Bowler concludes with a perceptive comment this was a theology in motion that read spiritual insight backwards into circumstance. It's these circumstances which seem so different in Africa. Yet for our purposes, she also writes, on one level, the appeal of prosperity theology is obvious. The prosperity gospel of health and wealth sells a compelling bill of goods God, wealth, and a healthy body to enjoy it. But it's the feelings that lift believers' chins and square their shoulders that is its fundamental achievement. The first step in accessing this good news is the belief that things can get better. The prosperity gospel's chief allure is simple optimism. Throughout services in every prosperity church, the message of cultivated cheerfulness is proclaimed. Don't complain. Everyone's got a sad story. Speak only positively and believe for the best. Bowler comments that this positivity was perhaps the movement's greatest gift. The positivity is both its greatest gift and its heaviest burden because eventually, uh, it's a burden, because eventually a reckoning of the efficacy of the prosperity gospel will probably become insistent 
although this can be deferred for quite some time. As a brief aside, let me raise an issue of ecclesiology. Protestant churches have long stressed the self-sufficiency of local churches. It's part of their three self mantra. Local churches must be self-governing, self-propagating and self-funding. What Africans often call the Catholic model is very different. The Catholic church is funded largely from abroad on the grounds that it would be an unbearable imposition to require adherents, many quite poor themselves, to supply what is required. But by contrast, many of these newer churches have been very successful in raising huge funds from these same people. Many of you will know of the prophet Joshua in Lagos, buried just last month. Forbes estimated his fortune at 10 to $15 million with a private jet. His fellow mega Pentecostal megastar, also from Lagos, David Oyedepo of Winner's Chapel, has a fortune estimated at $150 million with four private jets. This is the very opposite of the Catholic model. If the appeal of the first element of Africa's Pentecostal explosion needs some explanation, that's the prosperity gospel, the second element, the enchanted religious imagination, is easier to explain. For people seeking spiritual explanation for their misfortunes, for sickness, divorce, childlessness, unemployment, bankruptcy, here's the answer, an ancestral curse, a spell, a witch, some form of spiritual agency. This need the newer churches meet head on. A prophet can diagnose the spirit cause, break the curse. Many will actually reverse the curse, sending the curse back to the person who sent it to you or cast out the spirit responsible for the problem. Of course, one could argue that the entire Catholic involvement in schools and clinics is geared to address this exactly this issue by showing that so many misfortunes are explicable on another register altogether. But I have long argued, rightly or wrongly, and Stan tells me often quite wrongly, that there has been a reluctance on the part of African theologians, or even especially those claiming they are considering culture, to address this issue, to appreciate the wide appeal of this popular imagination. To bring home the prevalence of this enchanted religious imagination, a 2010 United Nations report claims that in the Central African Republic, 25% of all cases brought to court in the capital Bangui and 80 to 90% in Central Africa's rural courts concern witchcraft. As a result, 70% of prisoners in Bangui's central prison are there on the basis of witchcraft accusations. A very recent analysis of this phenomenon is Bob Priest's collaborative study of all the issues relating to a possible 50,000 child witches in the city of Kinshasa. This phenomenon seems linked to deteriorating socioeconomic conditions. As living conditions deteriorated, survival becoming hard, even impossible, many children have become vulnerable. One's own children have been safe enough, but others more remotely connected have tended to be cast out, often on the ground that they are witches responsible for the household's misfortunes. Bob Priest coordinated this study from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School here in Chicago. I do not know of any Catholic attempts similar to priests to address this religious imagination and phenomena like those in Kinshasa which flow from it. I ordered these remarks around Melilake's insistence on taking context seriously. By definition, an African contextual theology has to take the context seriously. The particularities are crucial. To analyze the context in Africa, requires effort. An adequate picture requires competence in several areas to detect causes, to devise practical solutions. 
Some of my points earlier revolved around Catholicism's dependence on aid. Aid is a subject of enormous complexity. I mentioned above Bob Calderizzi's book, The Catholic Church and Development. He has another book entitled The Trouble with Africa, Why Foreign Aid is Not Working. This is a serious analysis of the whole aid issue. Calderizzi is no more infallible than the rest of us, though he has probably had more experience of the phenomenon than most. He is a writer of the Melaleke kind, passionate would describe him. Calderizzi is clear, stop all aid. It doesn't work, it does harm. Paul Collier, with probably the same experience of Africa, doesn't want to stop all aid, but does want it to be carefully targeted. Collier backs his work with serious statistical research. If these statistics are wrong, that needs to be said. If the statistics are anywhere near correct, the arguments he builds on them need to be taken seriously, or at least his faulty reasoning needs to be exposed. For example, Collier claims that military spending in Africa is a massive problem, diverting scarce resources from where they are needed. He and his students have calculated that 40% of all aid ends up directly or indirectly subsidizing the military. He descends to details, like the price of a Kalashnikov in East Africa. If you're interested, the AK-47, the insurgent's weapon of choice, costs 50% of what it costs in the Caucasus. Military spending is part of Africa's context. Already this year, the world has seen five military coups, more than the number of the last five years together. And four of those are in Africa, Chad, Mali, Guinea, and two weeks ago in Sudan. Maybe reflections on processions within the Trinity can be done in an ivory tower, but a theology that claims to be anchored in the African context needs to address issues like these. To return to Melaleke, a constant concern of his is the seemingly irreversible impact of imperialism or colonialism. He mentions the word or cognates 10 times in this single article against public theology. Bernard Porter makes a case to unpack such abstract nouns. There can be no doubt that the development of capitalism has been the dominant factor in human history over the last 200 years, easily outranking imperialism. Most of what has happened in the world since the demise of empires has been due to a complex of factors of which imperialism was just one, or rather three or four, depending on the type of imperialism involved. Global capitalism, says Porter, has been probably the most powerful material force in modern world history, even inevitable, or so it seems now in days of its near universal triumph. Capitalism rode imperialism while it could, but after its demise, capitalism si simply dismounted and found other carriers. Porter insists, much largely depends on semantics. It remains important to try to unravel the different strands in what you call imperialism in order to understand it better. There's too little of that in popular discourse these days. We probably agree that we can never have too much precision in any academic discipline. In fact, that's probably what Melaleke is arguing. The form of colonialism in South Africa with all its minerals was inseparably bound up with capitalism. If Melaleke can be read that way, I wonder if the same could be said for Father Paul Bere in Sarpong lecture from the Arupe Institute in Ghana last month. He had a title rather like Melaleke's because people differ, should African theology go global? Because people differ, should African theology go global? If I understood him, 
he seemed to be making a point slightly different from Melalekis, that we study our situation, understood mainly culturally, understandable in a lecture honoring Archbishop Sarpong, and Africa goes global by making that understanding available to the local church. If global capitalism is indeed the most powerful phenomenon affecting profoundly the whole world, to look at the world as a whole, to consider the big global picture may not be so misplaced. I know global capitalism is not highly favored here at DePaul Center. I appreciate that. I sympathize with any attempt at a radical reworking of the world system. But in the meantime, what practically might be done, especially in part of the globe, which though not powerless, can't exert the pressure some others can. While working towards this restructuring, I personally, at least until the tragedy of the last few months, would have invited anyone to invest in Ethiopia and provide some employment and some wages. Ethiopia's population is estimated now about 110 million. Some respectable predictions give projection of 200 million in 2050. That's another 80 million added in 29 years. Nobody really knows the unemployment rate now. I shudder to think what it may rise to. One can only speculate on the role of unemployment in Ethiopia's current tragedy. That's the sort of question that merits consideration in any practical theological reflection. Many of suggestions, I above mentioned Calderese and Collier in connection with aid. In their suggestions, both indicate that much blame is misplaced. Calderese in his Belaleke mode can write, to this day, the wrong reasons are being cited for the continent's decline. How can people face the future when they cannot even face the facts? I have no special expertise in the matter of development economics, but I try to read what I can. And to repeat what I said above about aid, if their statistics are wrong, that needs to be said. If they're anywhere near correct, their arguments need to be taken seriously. To conclude, I think Melaleke is correct to stress the particular conditions of Africa. Maybe, however, those conditions are not unrelated to wider processes. The precise workings of those processes need careful analysis and practical measures need to be suggested. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Paul Gifford. That was quite an engaging and uh, captivating lecture. And already, as you were speaking, uh, different people have been fielding questions. Now, um, and to all of you out there, uh, we will try as much as uh, possible within the limited time to uh, uh, pose these questions to Professor Gifford. What I have tried to do is to kind of synthesize these questions into four key areas. And the first uh, for you, Professor Gifford, this is a question from uh, Jean-Paul, uh, who I suppose is from Ethiopia, and also uh, the same question coming from John Siyumbo. And uh, we are seeing presently the crisis engulfing Ethiopia. Uh, the human toll, the economic toll, the social and political toll, and the future is uncertain. You live in Ethiopia. You've lived in Africa 40 years and counting. You've seen, seen it all, as it were. You talked about Ethiopia uh, in a very uh, positive way, earlier until this crisis, the progress that was beginning to, uh, to, to show the stability. So how can your proposal address the present crisis in Ethiopia, if I put it that way? Or in other words, 
how can African theologians uh, using or working on your proposal uh, help to bring some intervention that can help in stopping this crisis from becoming a war and a, a total breakdown of, uh, of uh, this great experiment. I don't claim to have any great insight into what's going on in Ethiopia. For one thing, communication is quite scant. We don't really know what has been happening or what is happening behind the lines. But as far as the churches are concerned, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church that I featured used to be quite, well, it was Ethiopian culture was identified almost with the church. But the communist Derg more or less marginalized the church. The Catholic church is very small and marginalized anyway. I suppose the only suggestion I could make is as institutions, I, it seems to me that is one of the Ethiopia greatly, stronger institutions, parliament, judiciary, um, civil society, every, everything needs to be strengthened or it would help if it was strengthened. And the, to the extent that the Christian churches could strengthen themselves and illustrate what a functioning institution can do, that would be helpful. But beyond that, I really can't say much about Ethiopia. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and still along the same line, um, yeah, Professor J. Carney, raise this a very interesting question from your book, Christianity, Development and Modernity in Africa. You seem to have suggested this uh, rubric of getting to Denmark, uh, that Denmark is the destination to which Africa's Catholic Church in general is nudging Africa. And this is within the context of a few other questions that have been raised. Matthew, with Dampaga, Banse, uh, takes some issues with uh, with you about uh, like you dismiss aid and development to help the young churches in uh, in in Africa. And John Sivalon says, well, Pope Benedict's notion of aid and development is different from that of Pope Francis. So, uh, if you can throw more light on some of these uh, points being raised within this uh, context of aid and development, are you against supporting the young churches? Are you proposing a Denmark's model? And um, uh, what would it look like in the light of uh, what Pope Francis is asking us uh, to be a poor and merciful church, not only in Africa, but all over the world? <laughs> I'm interested you picked up that that idea of getting to Denmark. It actually comes from a World Bank paper, but the idea is that um, Denmark's not perfect. The Danes are human after all, but it's a relatively stable, it's quite prosperous, it's democratic, minorities are looked after, it has a decent education system and a health system, therefore, Try and learn from that. I think that's that's the point the World Bank was making. Th th there are examples out there that can illustrate a path forward. It would be a different path, but that could be the goal. I accept, yes, there, I think there is something of a tension between Pope Benedict and uh, Pope Francis. And I am really drawing attention to the fact that I've written about elsewhere, this general secularization to the extent that, see, Calderisi can almost applaud a Catholic hospital being passed on to the new generation without anybody being bothered about religious dimension. And I just think, that issue needs to be addressed by theologians. This increasing secularization, 
I think it's happening all over the world, but that's the sort of issue I wish theologians would grapple with. What can we do about increasing secularization? I, I made the point in regard to this, what I call this, this new cognitive style. If people are dealing with the scientific mentality, the former mode of, of understanding and experiencing reality by means of otherworldly forces hasn't necessarily been den denied, but it has been peripheralized. And people who are all the time or most of the time operating on that scientific level, sometimes hardly ever advert to the otherworldly. So, so this is a real issue for Christianity, for theology and, and for society. Yeah, uh, thank you. And just staying with that question, uh, uh, Sister John Muma from uh, Solidarity uh, for South Sudan uh, raises a, a key question, and we will get to the other part of the question about uh, the designation. You you think that the Catholic Church uh, is has is not different from uh, an NGO, but in the documents, including. Uh, Veritas Caritate, uh, Pope Benedict made that clear that the Catholic Church is not an NGO. And Pope Francis has also made that clear in the self-understanding of Catholics, uh, Catholic agencies. Uh, they don't self-identify, uh, even though they might have styles and the goals that might fit into NGO is driven by evangelical councils, is, is driven by an understanding of this incarnation that God uh, stepped into the chaos of uh, human history. And so having boots on the ground is doing exactly what Jesus did. Uh, unless you're saying, uh, Professor Gifford, that Jesus was just a social worker, an NGO uh, guy, so uh, Sister Moma would like you to uh, address address this issue, whether you are interpreting uh, something uh, outside of the self understanding of the practitioners of that of that uh, Catholic uh, social agencies. I'm um, the self understanding of the church of the church operators can be exactly as you said. They can be motivated by Christian principles and doing this all in accordance with Christian values for Christian reasons. But, but Calderizi is saying that it seems that is disappearing. Now, I'm not a theologian. I'm from a department of the study of religions. I try to study Africa just as somebody would study women's groups in Africa, political parties, trade unions in Africa. And just observing, I think that the involvement of the Catholic Church, it is enormous and it's wonderful. I, I totally applaud. I've argued that I don't think any other agency comes near it in its contribution. But I also note that it has become much more involved, much more widely, than ordinary schools and hospitals that it used to be involved in. Now it's involved in everything. Now, um, this is an issue, it seems to me, the, the secularization of these agencies. The, the expression NGOization of Christianity, I first heard in the early 90s, back with the All Africa Conference of Churches. And th they didn't have the answer either. But The, the, the whole issue, the, the issue arises because something like the United States government, the United States aid cannot go to churches because of the separation of church and state. So many churches created a wholly owned subsidiary to access these funds, like the SORSO, the Salvation Army World Relief Organization. 
the ADRA, the Adventist Development and Relief Agency. They are set up so that the money that can't go to a church can go for relief and development, which by definition has to be secular or they won't get the American money. Now, to me, that's an issue. Our, uh, so are the churches by doing all this, and I applaud what they do, what they do is magnificent, but what about that issue of Christianity within all this? Yeah, and that takes takes us to um, a, a couple of uh, insights uh, and questions from uh, our our audience today. Is uh, your characterization of this momentum of Christian expansion in Africa as uh, enchantment? Um, the question is about spiritual agency. Uh, our one of our uh, our listeners, David uh, Swingama, says there have been a lot of people who have given their lives, driven by this religious orientation. There have been a number of church leaders who have given their lives, who have been killed, fighting for good governance fighting corruption, injustice. And um, Pentecostals within the Catholic Church as well as outside Catholic charismatism uh, is a motivation for transforming the world. So um, a couple of our, our audience, members of the audience, had case Peter Nderu uh, saying, we need to deepen the faith to increase agency Fearway is saying uh, people have to evangelize in order to win the world uh, for Christ, for uh, salvation. So the, there is, if you can throw, throw some light about this enchantment that you see, which some people see as spiritual agency that is contributing to uh, transforming Africa through the sacrificial acts of so many heroes. Even so many people who are on the front lines reversing uh, this uh, uh, cycle of decay, breaking it through Christian activism, witnessing. Uh, so if you, can, if you can speak to this uh, spiritual agency that uh, you don't see uh, in Pentecostalism and the rise of uh, spirit movement and uh, uh, a few other things you identify. Of course, to the extent that Pentecostalism is um, developing Africa, I'm all in favor. But those two characteristics I singled out, the prosperity gospel and the stress on spirit agency, I personally have issues with. The prosperity gospel, as I said, does give people optimism, makes you aim high, nothing, nothing can stop you, you can achieve great things. Now the motivation there is wonderful, but overall I do not regard the prosperity gospel as doing much to help Africa. And as for the spirit agency, that brings up the, the, the other issue of how do you interpret things like malaria, disease, divorce, bankruptcy. How do you experience them? Everybody, as far as we can tell, everybody at all ages, everywhere, has in the past experienced reality in terms of otherworldly forces. But about 400 years ago in Northwest Europe, you can trace another cognitive mode arising, and you can link it to Copernicus, Galileo, Brahe, Lavoisier, Priestley, you can plot this whole course. Some call it the rise of science, the others don't, the scientific revolution. But it has given rise to another, it has given rise to another whole cognitive mode no longer is reality experienced in terms of otherworldly forces, 
but we have this rationality of functional instrumentality that has brought in the modern world of computers, air travel, antibiotics. If you want a quick illustration of the shift, look at the 14th century plague epidemic in Europe. The solution was more prayers, more masses, novenas, more devotion to relics. Here we've got the COVID pandemic. What's the solution? Throw billions of dollars at some pharmaceutical companies to develop vaccines. There in a nutshell, you have a whole change of cognitive mode. Now, this hasn't brought in paradise anything but. The problems of this new cognitive mode are enormous, just for, for a couple. The, this extractive mode it, it operates with has led to the whole ecological debacle they were talking about in Glasgow last week. It's led to such imbalance that migration shifts are becoming almost insupportable. But above all, a society that really has no shared values, can it exist? All societies in the past have been based on values and shared values normally provided by religion. But a society that is driven only by profit, productivity and power, can it survive? So there are enormous, there are now enormous issues, but I wish those are the issues that theologians would grapple with, including African theologians. It's, it's that shift to a whole new cognitive mode from understanding reality in terms of witches and spirits that I think could well be, dis, be more carefully discussed in Africa. Yeah, thank you. Um, but some people will say, Professor Gifford, that um, that is what people are doing through enculturation. They are already analyzing cultures, uh, distinguishing African culture, the beauty of African culture uh, against uh, what you've described now, the postmodern, even the pre-modern, uh, Western culture, what you call uh, productivity, profit, and power is that kind of culture that give rise to racism, uh, all kinds of oppressive laws made in the West against women that persist in the church, uh, toxic or dominant patriarchy uh, is a culture that produced the Holocaust, uh, is a culture that uh, produced the arms race, the production of weapons of mass destruction. So enculturation, some African theologians would claim, is an attempt to take what is good in Africa, what is good outside of Africa, in order to build Christianity on a strong foundation where the faith is a spiritual agency as well as a social agency, bringing together these two, like one of our writers, uh, one of the questions says, to bring a balance between social development and spiritual development. Those two are not uh, binaries. So isn't it uh, what African uh, critical enculturation theologians are developing? People like uh, Magesa, uh, for instance, to mention uh, someone whose work has been quite influential. Yes. No, I, I, take, all, I take all that. Um, my issue with enculturation, as you pointed out the other day, rightly or wrongly, wrongly you, you were saying, um, but, well, one thing is that I don't think the culture is dealt with, in some cases, with full attention to the reality. For example, Heike Berent's study of, um, of the Uganda Martyrs group 
in the kingdom of Vittoro. In, in fact, the Catholic Church there, because of the troubles in that area of Uganda, they're considerable. And in the past, a king was responsible for keeping people safe. The Ugandan government hasn't done a great deal. So the Catholic Church, this lay movement has stepped up and basically it is a witch finding organization. And they go around villages and with a whole team, they can detect witches and they can cure them and, and take them to confession and communion and so on. But the, the, that issue of witch finding under the guise of um, Catholicism, Catholic Uganda Martyrs Guild, I wish I didn't have to go to a German anthropologist to discover all this. I wish an issue like that was actually dealt with by Catholic theologians who actually drew conclusions and organized a, a program as a result of it. So that's one, but I suppose my bigger issue with, with the many efforts in enculturation is that I think this idea that I mentioned about this new cognitive mode has really little to do with culture. I want to get off the register of culture altogether. The, the and the, um, I, I want to say that really this has got or very little to do with culture. Um, the, the it's not discussed on that register. This this it, it's open to any culture, and in fact. People, the, the people who study this don't really agree on why it developed, where it did and when. But one thing they do seem agreed on that it could never have developed in China. Now, these days, of course, once it is available, the Chinese have taken it up and can run with it probably as well as anybody. And now they're rivaling America in their innovation, internet, software development, all these sorts of things. So I don't think it's an issue at all because it's available to anybody. If, if the Beninwa in Cotonou decide to put up and do what America does at Cape Canaveral, they can do exactly the same, put a rocket into space. This has got very little to do with culture. But it is so powerful today that really all cultures have to take it on board or lag behind. That's does that make sense? Yeah, uh, it makes um, sense in a in a way that uh, it seems a bit ahistorical. Uh, I'm sorry to say that you locate Africa uh, as this unique space that is untouched somehow. Uh, what happens in Africa uh, seems to be unique to Africa, but even prosperity gospel is a big thing here in the United States. It didn't start in Africa, it started in America. Uh, you go to Brazil, you have uh, Pentecostals and evangelicals uh, spreading in Brazil, in South Korea, in Philippines, uh even in parts of eastern eastern europe uh, one of the biggest pentecostal churches in eastern europe is uh, in kiev so um it's also there are computers africa so i don't know whether you see africa as this uh this space that is removed because that's where i think uh, some whether you can speak more to this historical uh both the questions of colonialism, slavery, racism, some of the uh, destructive uh, neoliberal capitalistic uh, policies and programs and stratagems that uh, the World Bank, WTO, these are some of the critiques that uh, Maluleke, whose work you cited, uh, pointed out why he's against the kind of public theology or political theology that uh, uh, he might identify a, a bit of it in your work, uh, that 
project this vision, uh, even a dream of Africa, without taking into serious consideration the complicated and complex and destructive forces of Western modernity in Africa. So, um, yeah, that would be my own, there's not a question from the audience, but that would, would be my own uh, uh, suggestion to find out uh, how this can happen without addressing the fact that these, the, wep the weapons that are being used in Ethiopia to fight are not produced in Africa. You mentioned about the cost of getting a gun, uh, that a continent that is so rich in human resources uh, is is caught in this fragmentation. So um, so you giving theologians the task in Africa to uh, take the the discussion on culture to more scientific uh, transition to science, but you're also not giving them uh, the the space to unpack, unburden these these historical factors. You, you didn't mention any of them uh, as part of the problem that, uh, that uh, are to be addressed, especially uh, that African theologians are mentioning this, they're mentioning racism, imperialism. Why is it that France is all over Africa? Why is it that in my home country, Nigeria, Amer uh, uh, Shell, they're destroying the environment? that laws on the environment that is not being applied, that is, I mean, environmental practices that are not applied in other parts of the world. You have a gas, gas flame and fracking taking place in Nigeria, in Angola. So uh, that would be my, my, my own personal question. How do you locate this discourse within these uh, global processes and global complications that make, make, mess, make mess up the whole, the whole effort? in the continent of Africa? Well, for a start, I don't think there's anything racist in talking about this new cognitive mode. As I say, it's available everywhere. The Chinese have picked it up, even though it could never have developed there. Uh, the Japanese, the South Koreans, the Vietnamese, if, if, if th this rationality of functional instrumentality can lead to all sorts of things. But that's where the, to me, that's where the, so it's not, it's not a cultural issue. It's an issue of um, uh, cognitive mode. And with that cognitive mode, as I mentioned, there has become an enormous imbalance in the world of power. Up till about 1800, evidently, world standard of living in all areas was pretty much the same. The, the life expectancy in London in 1800 was 28. But with this new understanding, all sorts of things became possible and have given rise to this total imbalance of power. So I, I just think this is human nature. Those who've got power do tend to lord it over those that they can. And that's what you've got, the total imbalance of power. And it just seems to me that that increases them to, to uh, develop one's own capacity to respond, to compete, to be equal, to take one's place in the, in the world today as, an, as the equal of other parts of the world. But the imbalance of power leading to all these things, I think that... Yeah, we can't hear you, Paul. The uh, there's a problem with the audio. Can oh, you speak? Sorry. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you now. Uh, can you speak now, uh, uh, Professor Gifford? Um, there's a problem with the audio. We can't hear you. You is there a problem with the audio? Right? Yes. Yes, we can hear you now. I'm speak. You can hear me now. Yes. Yes. Keep going. I'm sorry. Yes. I, I don't know what that what that that was. All I was saying was it's human nature being what it is. This is what original sin means, isn't it? That 
those with power will oppress those that they can oppress unless there are checks and balances on them. And without those checks and balances, this seems the natural human condition, unfortunately, hum original sin. So, so um, that's what happened, I mean, all over the place. And profit, shell, in Nigeria, all these, all these um, countries, um, that's that's what happens. Uh, yeah, thank thank you, Professor Gifford. We have three more minutes to the end of this session. I know uh, it has uh, been a wonderful time, and um, uh, all these questions we are not able to answer all these questions. But my last, uh, the last word will go to you. Uh, before we give a final vote of thanks, uh, Professor Gifford, you spent most of your adult life in the continent of Africa. You love this continent so much that um, you made you made it your home. So, really, what what surprises you? What what was your wow experience about Africa? What do you think Africa? Uh, can offer to to the West to someone from New Zealand about especially the 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 contradictions you've pointed out in um, uh, modernity, profit, uh, production, power, and the absence of enduring value because power then domination is uh, so. Uh, we like to know what. What 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 is it that uh, uh, you? What are those things you love about Africa that uh, you, you you've kept you've kept this your friendship and your your marriage with this continent for close to going to the fifth decade? Well, the biggest thing is the friends I've made, the African people, of course, um, and and that's what's so sad about Ethiopia now. The Ethiopia. It's very sad. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is very sad, Paul. It is. It is. And um, we'll, we'll feel your pain. It's also the pain of all of us. Um, no, but there, there, there is hope. It, it's, it's, it's wonderful. <clears throat> As you say, I wouldn't wouldn't live there if I didn't think that. Yeah. Uh, so um, we want to thank you, um, Professor Gifford. Um, we all see your love. Your love for the continent is so clear. It's so deep. But not just for the continent, but also your love for humanity. Um, you know, you represent the journey that most of us are being called to make every day. From New Zealand, you left your homeland, you went to UK, spent time there, made it your home, and then you went to Africa. And, you know, you went to Japan as well. And <laughs> where, where you found the love of your life, if I may share something that you don't like to talk often. Uh, no, I didn't find her in Japan. I found her in Zimbabwe. <laughs> so that, on that note, Africa gave you the most precious gift, the gift of your wife, who is from Japan. So really, you, you've you lived a life of uh, pilgrimage, which I think is uh, the history of Christianity. Christianity is a pilgrim. I started from Palestine. Now it found its place in Africa. So we thank you, and uh, we will ask everyone to please join me. You might not see the over 78 people who have joined us to thank Professor Gifford for this very engaging and uh, profound uh, lecture. And um, we thank you all for joining us.
we thank especially our team, those who put this together, Karen Kraft, our managing editor, and who keeps everything together for us. They are the uh, the hidden hands that uh, cook the food. Thank you to Marlon, who is our business manager, and um, to our student worker, um, uh, Finnegan and uh, Morgan. And we thank also the director of the center, uh, who is unable to join us today, Professor Bill Kavanaugh, and uh, uh, my other colleague, senior research professor, Michael Borde. So at the center, we are, we are a trinity, uh, the trinity of uh, Bill, Michael, and Stan. The only thing is that we work so together that um, it's, uh, it's, it, it, we dance together that we don't see the dance of anyone really distinct, uh, distinctive, but that's what we are. And we thank you again, Professor Gifford. Um, please, we ask you to stay tuned. You'll be getting updates from the center, from Karen. This lecture is being recorded, has been recorded, and will be available to all of you and you will get the notice of the uh, when the recording is ready for viewing so once again thank you everyone and wherever you are we wish you a wonderful day uh and um, a wonderful night and um, yeah professor gifford you want to say say, say the final word just uh, to to wish everyone uh, thank everyone for being here yes i thank everyone for being here and thank you for moderating stan Okay, so this lecture is over now. We say goodbye to you and see you again soon. Bye.